Well, I'm very excited to introduce our guest speaker today, Nick Parsons. Uh, Nick is the Managing Director for Stratum Foundation, and he's a longtime friend of Current. Uh, you might recognize him from being here with us many weeks last summer. He was also here last week delivering an awesome message in our Imperfect Heroes series. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what God has put on his heart, so I'm going to read scripture while he comes up, but can you join me in giving Nick a really warm welcome? So today's scripture is 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 17, and 26 through 27. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Uh, Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to the house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done Displease the Lord. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, Current. Uh, today we are continuing the series Imperfect Heroes uh, that you guys have been in the middle of. We're looking at one of the darkest uh, episodes in the life of David. David was one of the most significant kings of Israel, one of the most prominent and important figures in all of the Bible. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the biblical story, you might remember that David was this humble shepherd who became a famed warrior. He slayed the giant Goliath. He defeated the enemies of Israel. He rescued the nation from their enemies. And then David is eventually anointed as like God's specific choice to be the new king of the nation. David, he's also a musician and a poet. He wrote many songs and psalms. At least 73 of the 150 psalms we have in the book of Psalms are written and explicitly authored by David. So the same man we read about in that story the same, is the same man who wrote Psalm 23. Let me read you the first four verses. It might be familiar to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David is the same man who wrote these words as well from Psalm 40, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. 
How can we reconcile what we read in these words from Psalms with the actions of David and the rest of the story that we read in the, in the story that we read earlier? How do we align that story that we just heard with the, the way that David's portrayed in the Bible, right? He's a man who loves God deeply. He sacrifices for his nation. To be honest, I'm, I'm not sure we can reconcile these things. Uh, you heard the story in the scripture reading, and, and sometimes when you know a little bit more about the, the context and the background of the characters, it can make their actions like easier to understand or to empathize with. But in this case, if you know a little bit of the background, it, it doesn't make it any easier. It actually shows David's actions to be even worse. Consider Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. He's not just a random soldier that happens to be married to a beautiful woman who's desired by a king. No, Uriah is actually listed as one of David's mighty men, which is a title that was meant that meant that he was one of like 37 famous soldiers in the country. These are people who are renowned for their courage and their valor, for their for what they did and how, uh, battles they fought. He's like a Congressional Medal of Honor winner who fought right alongside David. Moreover, Uriah is a Hittite. That means he's someone from a neighboring tribe of Israel. He's a convert to Judaism. As a Hittite, he's an ethnic minority who somehow is grafted into this country, proved himself so greatly in life and battle that he is honored as one of the nation's greatest war heroes. Imagine the character of that kind of man. We see glimpses of it in the text. Uriah, he refuses any privilege that his fellow soldiers who are off in battle wouldn't receive. He's this great man, this national hero, a man who served David, who fought alongside him, and he served the nation of Israel faithfully. So what David does to him here is beyond betrayal. Or, of course, consider Bathsheba. Bathsheba, at times in history, has been characterized by some biblical interpreters as somehow tempting David by bathing publicly on a roof. Uh, often this story is referred to as David's adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, that's how I remember hearing about it and learning about it uh, as a young adult. But, but this understanding of Bathsheba really isn't a fair portrayal of her. There is nothing in the text that make it clear that Bathsheba is anything other than a victim of David's abuse of power as a king, or even sexual abuse. A bathing on her roof was not at all something indecent. It was a no normal thing people would do. All indications we have in the text are that Bathsheba is only doing what she must do to survive in a society where a king's will would not be able to be resisted. Uh, what we read in the story with David, it's not adultery, it's abuse. That's how dark and frankly evil David's actions are. The betrayal of a loyal subject and a fellow soldier, the sexual abuse of a married woman, the abuse of David's power and his responsibility as the king of Israel, all of this compounded and made worse by an attempted cover-up, which eventually leads to the murder of Uriah. And then lastly, David, he takes this now widowed woman and he marries her. In all of this, he makes mistake after mistake. He's trying again and again to cover up his sin, trying to make it look like Bathsheba's pregnancy is just the result of a quick new marriage. It's a terrible story. And David, he's not just an imperfect hero. He's an inexcusable one. We should be outraged by him. But, so what can we learn from a text like this? Why study a text like this in the episode of a life of a major biblical character? Well, in some ways, I'm actually kind of grateful that stories like this are included in the Bible. The Bible is a very honest book. It doesn't paint its heroes as always being upright. Uh, the Bible includes in the Old and New Testament the failings and the falls of some of its heroes right alongside their victories and their successes. The Bible is an authentic book. It doesn't sugarcoat its history. And it can be uncomfortable to read these kinds of stories, but I'm also grateful that stories like this are included in the Bible. They teach us something. Because when we read a story like this, we see an uncomfortable truth, that all people, the best included, are capable of great sin and injustice. If someone like David can sin like this, anyone can. And as we see in the text, the results can be catastrophic. Uh, moreover, I believe that God actually includes a story like this for our benefit. He gives us a story like this so that we might learn something about him and about ourselves. God sends us a story like this to challenge us, to even benefit us, to see ourselves in each of the characters so that we might have some help when we're betrayed, when we're victims of the actions of others, or even when we too fail. So I have three points today. Uh, let me give it to you up front, and then we're going to walk through them. First, God cares about sin and injustice. God cares about sin and injustice. Second, grace is available and costly. Grace is available and costly. And third, redemption is possible and complicated. Redemption is possible and complicated. Uh, if you have a Bible today or a Bible app you want to follow along, you can open up to 2 Samuel chapter 12, where we're going to be for the next bit. Uh, as we flesh out our first point, God cares about sin and injustice. 
And in a minute, I'm going to read chapter 12, but let me just remind us of the last words of chapter 11, verse 27. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. God sees what David has done, and he is angry. He is disappointed. He doesn't ignore the problem because of David's position or excuse his actions because of his past relationship with David. No, God sees the sin and injustice here, and he acts. He is not silent. There will be severe consequences for David. But how God responds in this story is also interesting. He doesn't just send judgment and consequence. God sends a story. He sends a storyteller. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 12, it says this. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your own house, your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who's close to you. He will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. What you did in secret, you did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Heavy stuff. What a turn of events. <laughs> David, he hears this story from Nathan. It's his own story, but at first he doesn't recognize it at all. David burns with anger when he hears it. He sees the sin and the injustice in the story, and he doesn't just want justice to be done. He wants wrath. It's interesting in David's angered response, if you think about it and you study it, that he doesn't really propose a fair judgment for this rich man who's stolen this poor man's beloved lamb. David doesn't propose an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth or a lamb for a lamb like the Old Testament law required. No, David goes way beyond the Old Testament law, what it would require in this situation. He says the man should pay four times over. No, wait, he should also die for his crimes. I think it's really interesting how David responds to this person's sin, the story of another person's sin and injustice. David's just broken like over half the Ten Commandments. He's murdered his friend. He's taken advantage of a married woman. He has abused his power. And yet, when he hears this story, he is quick to judge because he doesn't see himself in that story at all. I, I think we see something about human nature here, that all of us as humans, we are quick to see other people's sin, to proclaim what we think should happen to them, we all judge others more quickly and often more harshly than we judge ourselves, which is really what part of what makes uh, Nathan's approach so effective. He draws David in with a story of someone else. And it's only after David has passed judgment that Nathan reveals who the story is really about. Nathan makes it very clear to David that the person David is casting judgment on is in fact himself. David is the rich man who stole from another. David is the unjust man who killed a poor man's beloved. I, when I imagine this story in my mind, I imagine, you know, David hearing it and like leaning forward in his chair, like indignant, growing in anger as he hears the story. And then eventually he just shouts with like a hand raised, like, that guy deserves to die. And then Nathan says to him, you are the man. And I just imagine like David slumping back in his chair, his sin and the injustice of his actions laid bare before him. He begins to see clearly for the first time. We, we read a little of his response in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, and then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Even though David's words here are really short, I've sinned against the Lord is all we have in this text, we can actually conclude from the rest of the biblical story that these are very genuine words of repentance. David is fully owning his sin here, 
Uh, we know this because there's a bunch more of the biblical story about David, but also because the Bible includes like a fuller response to Nathan uh, that David has written in the book of Psalms at Psalm 51. Uh, Psalm 51 is explicitly David's response to this moment. It's a poem and a song of thorough repentance. Uh, that psalm it includes phrases like, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. David is owning his sin. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's done. Well, let me read the first four verses of Psalm 51. It says this, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David is fully coming to terms with the depth of his sin. That phrase, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. This isn't David minimizing his sin, overlooking the cost of his sin to others. No, I think it's him reckoning with the reality that David has fully broken, like so many of God, God's commandments, that he has so deeply sinned against God. This God who's not just like an abstract figure, but he's the maker of Uriah and Bathsheba. He's the man in the story, ultimately, that was hurt. God, the one who brought him from obscurity to reigning as a king. God, who rescued him again and again. David is owning all of his sin, past and present, before God. This moment with Nathan, it creates this sort of profound re-examining of David's life and his actions. And he realizes how deeply he failed, how profoundly he has been a sinner. And he asks God for mercy. He pleads for mercy and for grace. And so how does God, using Nathan, respond to David's genuine repentance? Let's examine our second point, number two. Grace is available and costly. Let me read Nathan's response. This is 2 Samuel 12, 2 Samuel 12 14. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. Uh, throughout this story, a couple things are really clear. Grace is indeed available but there's also a massive cost for David's actions. Not just the natural causes and the implications of his behavior. No, there's some kind of divine justice being meted out. God tells David that he will bring calamity on him, that his life will be marked by warfare, that God will allow his family, his wives, to be taken by another. Just a side note, we don't, we're not going to go into like depth on this, but I, but I think God isn't really causing many of these consequences so much as he is removing his divine protection from David. Whereas in the past, God has protected David again and again. He's now saying to David, okay, David, you want to do it on your own? You want to do this your way? Okay, good, you're on your own. And God knows what the result of him no longer protecting David will be, and it's tragic. Additionally, the child of this illicit activity is going to perish. There is an extreme cost to David's actions for himself and for the people around him. We often think of our own sin as only affecting us, but this story is a reminder. No, our sin affects others. David's actions are costly to him and to the people around him. But in the midst of all of this, there's also glimmers of grace. God does forgive David. He spares him the worst consequences. He doesn't end his relationship with David. He doesn't cast him away. He doesn't reject David. Listen to a little more of Psalm 51. This is verse 4 through 17. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would offer it. I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. That last line, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. David is declaring this from personal experience. He has sinned and acted unjustly, but we see that there is a grace that's available even for someone like David. And I think this at some level should scandalize us. It should make us uncomfortable, but it should also encourage us. For no matter what we have done, no matter what mess we have made, 
For those who own their sin and repent before God, grace is available. Uh, It's been said before, the grace is like water. It flows to even the lowest places. There is hope for everyone, even people like David. We, We should see this story as an extreme story, an extreme story of grace, given to us to remind us that, yes, sin is costly, but that grace and forgiveness are indeed possible, even for the worst of sinners. All right, let's look at our third point. Number three, redemption is possible and complicated. Redemption is possible and complicated. Uh, One of the things I actually love about this story is that God doesn't just forgive David and leave him in the shame and dysfunction of his actions. No, he actually works to bring good from this horrible situation, and not just for David. Do you ever wonder, like, how are things going to get any better? Like, in these horrible situations, maybe like me, think of our current political environment, radical polarization, tension, dysfunction of the wars happening, the stuff happening in Israel, uh, uh, you know, Palestine, uh, Russia, Ukraine, all these crazy things that are happening. Do you ever think God might be able to bring good from this? Or maybe you are in the middle of a relationship or have some kind of relationship in your life that has just so many layers of sin and dysfunction that you don't even know where to start. Do you believe that God could eventually redeem and bring anything good out of your situation. I don't know what mess you are in the middle of, but this story of extreme grace, of extreme sin, is also a story of extreme grace and incredible redemption and hope. Consider again David and Bathsheba just for a minute. A forced marriage, right? Born from an abuse of power, betrayal and lies, a murdered husband, a child lost. It's hard to think of a more messed up relationship. But it's from this relationship, this marriage, after David's sincere repentance and God's radical forgiveness, and I'm sure some amount of time, that something incredible happens. The Bible doesn't say much about the details, and I can only imagine how complicated and slow it must have been. But David and Bathsheba apparently build some kind of marriage out of this situation. I have to assume this because they end up having another child, and I have to believe that child is some kind of consensual relationship where trust was slowly rebuilt, it must have been like incredibly, insanely complicated. But that second child born to David and Bathsheba, Solomon, who would become king of Israel, the same Solomon that we talked about last week. Solomon had his own issues, we talked about those, but for a woman like Bathsheba to end up as the mother of a king, that's radical and complicated redemption. You can imagine a very different outcome to her story, right? where she is cast away in shame after the first child dies. But no, God sees Bathsheba in a very complicated way, redeems her situation, bringing her to a place of honor and power. I I wanna make something really clear. I'm not saying at all here today that if someone is in an abusive situation, they need to quietly stay in it because God might bring some good out of it. That is not what I'm saying. I think actually the opposite of that. It's not until sin is out in the open and genuine repentance happens that a conversation about redemption is even possible. God doesn't want anyone to stay in a dangerous and abusive relationship. If you you were there today or ever in your future, God wants you in a place of safety, not a place of abuse and fear. We see also in the story, if you recognize the details that Bathsheba, she doesn't handle this alone. David's repentance was public. It's like before the whole country. And so so Bathsheba isn't on her own in this unsafe relationship. Now the whole nation knew the story and because of this, she was protected. So please understand, if you need help in a relationship, don't leave today without talking to someone. But I also want to say clearly, because Bathsheba's story tells us and shows us that redemption is possible. No matter how dark the situations we find ourselves in, redemption is complicated, but it's possible. It may take a long time, the outcomes might be unexpected, but the story reminds us that even from the darkest beginnings, God can write beautiful endings to our stories. And we haven't even gotten to the most amazing redemption story. What's most amazing about this story is that it's from Solomon's descendants, from this child of David and Bathsheba, that eventually a new king will be born. A king better than David, better than Solomon. Jesus Christ, God's son, the true king of all kings. Jesus is the direct ancestor of David and Bathsheba. In the first chapter of the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, there's this genealogy. And it's this way of kind of tracing Jesus uh, and his lineage all the way back through the Bible, linking his story to many of the imperfect heroes we've studied in the series. The text is going to come up on the screen. I begin in Abraham in verse 1 and 2, who David talked about a few weeks ago. In verse 5, you read about Boaz, the father of Obad, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth and Boaz, whose story Gabe Garcia preached on a few weeks ago. 
And then eventually we come to verse 6. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Note here, see, God doesn't skip the complexity. The incident with Uriah and Bathsheba is not forgotten. It's not airbrushed. It's not overlooked. But God brought good. He redeemed. He brought Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, out of this mess. How amazing is that? Again, hear me today. I don't know what you're in the middle of, what you can't see your way out of, what you think could never be fixed in your life. But this story and really the whole biblical story show us that whatever we are facing, whatever complexity we're in the middle of can be redeemed. God can bring good out of anything. Yes, it's very complicated. It takes time, but redemption is indeed possible. So our points again, God cares about sin and injustice. Grace is available and costly. And third, redemption is possible and complicated. Uh, I'd love to spend the rest of our time together today just doing a little bit of personal application. I never want a sermon to just be abstract ideas. I'd love for this message to be personally applicable to all of us. And I'd like to do this morning by just considering each of the main characters that we read about in this text and just for a few moments drawing out some applications from each of them that might be helpful and relevant to us today. So first I want to consider the prophet Nathan. Nathan's an interesting person. He's called by God in this text to confront the injustice and the sin that he sees in the world. God like literally sends Nathan to speak truth to power. What can we learn and apply from considering Nathan? I think two things at least come to mind. First, I think each of us need to have and might need to ask God for the courage to be like Nathan, to be someone who isn't afraid to say what is true, to challenge sin, and to speak up when we see injustice. I think at the same time, each of us need to make space in our own lives to have some Nathans in our life that aren't afraid to speak truth to us, to call us out when we're wrong, to challenge us to live up to the callings God has for our lives. Some of us need to ask God for the courage to speak up like Nathan and the courage to make space for and listen to some Nathans in our own lives. Second thing you realize with Nathan is he's really wise in his confrontation with David. He's courageous and he's wise. He doesn't just say what is true. true. He doesn't just come in and like blast Nathan. No, he tells a story to win David over, to draw him in. Uh, As Tim Keller says, he says, Nathan doesn't just seek to confront David, he seeks to convert him. Nathan's goal is to bring David over to God's perspective, not just to tell him that he's wrong. And if we sense God is encouraging us to speak up, we too need to make every effort to use wisdom in the context of a relationship to make our appeals to others as effective as possible. Nathan's not trying to win an argument, he's trying to win David, to bring David back into alignment with the person God called him to be. So let's ask God to help us to have the courage and the wisdom of Nathan. Maybe some of us today really resonate with the characters of Bathsheba and Uriah. We've been betrayed by people. Some of us in this room are undoubtedly even victims of abuse of deception. We've been hurt by the people who are supposed to protect us, to love us. If that's you today, I want to say sincerely that I'm sorry. I want you to know that God sees you, that he's for you. We live in this world of free will, where the choices that other people make have a real impact in our lives, and some of those actions have hurt us deeply. All of us, each of us, in small or big ways, have been damaged by the sins of others. We are all, in part, products of dysfunctional relationships and systems. We've all been let down at times by the leaders in our homes or our jobs. Our friends have betrayed us, and for some of us, much, much worse. Uriah and Bathsheba's story reminds us that God sees all of this and that he will bring justice for those who are hurt by the sins of others and that he promises redemption, complicated, difficult, and as beautiful as redemption is. If you resonate with the experience of Uriah and Bathsheba, please hear this. God cares. Grace is available. Redemption is possible. And I don't don't want to jump over uh, this moment of just feeling that pain and just go to another application because it's really easy to jump over that. And and I think of Bathsheba's story and the hurt she must have really felt, and it's easy to just kind of like jump over to another uh, point to jump over the process of repentance that must have happened with David and her and to to really feel that. But I would be remiss to not at least mention that somewhere in her story, Bathsheba must have forgiven David. If you've been holding on to some hurt and you feel that it's time for you to finally or for the hundredth time release that hurt, 
to allow God to judge, to forgive, to leave justice in the hands of God, maybe today is a chance for you to commit to forgiveness again and for the first time to those who've hurt you. Forgiveness, it's a commitment, it's a process, it's, it's, it's a repetition. And maybe Bathsheba's story is a reminder for you today that it's time to take that next step of forgiveness, to allow God to be God, to let him be the judge, and for you to release your hurts to him. Let's ask God to help us practice forgiveness and trust like Bathsheba did. Uh, lastly in this story, I think about this a lot even when I was studying it, it's really easy to focus on the sin of David, to ask all kinds of questions about like, what does David deserve? What did David do? To have strong opinions like, was this adultery? Was this uh, abuse? And we can sort of rightly and, and like appropriately burn in anger at David's hypocrisy, at his betrayal of Uriah, at his abuse of Bathsheba, at his lying, at the hiding of his sin. But I think we need to be careful here or we all run the risk of making that same mistake that David did when he heard the story that Nathan told. David was much more concerned in that moment about the sin of another person, and he missed that that actually was a story about him. Is it possible that we might be tempted today to do something similar, to praise God in one aspect of our life and to hide sin in another? I think in some ways God is saying to each of us what Nathan said to David, this is a story about you. The Bible is super clear on this point, and if we are honest with ourselves, our consciences agree with what Romans 3.23 Romans 3, says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I think this is one of the main reasons God puts this story in the Bible, to challenge each of us, for we all have sinned. And yes, our sins might not be as crazy a day as David's, but that isn't the point. We have all fallen short. Who in this room hasn't betrayed someone? Who in this room hasn't lied? We have all sinned and tried our best to hide it from others. We have all been irresponsible with the power and the responsibility that God has given us. If we had the kind of power that David had, I shudder to think at some of the ways we might have abused it. And if we're honest, I think our stories, they're not as extreme as his, but there are moments in our lives and there are aspects of our character that don't look all that different than what we saw here in David's life. And just like David, we have today a choice. We can ignore the truth before us, we can close our eyes to a story that is really about us, or we can throw ourselves at the mercy of God in repentance. We can admit the truth that we too have all sinned and fallen short. We can pray a prayer like David did in Psalm 51, where he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, Lord, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. We can pray that today, knowing that, yes, there are consequences for our sin, but I have good news for you today. God offers us a better deal than he even offered David. For he doesn't take our son, but he offers his own. I read Romans 3.23 earlier. Let me read it again alongside the following two verses, Romans 3.24 and 25. It says this, For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Today we have heard an extreme story. And if what we read today is a story indeed to teach us something about ourselves, then the promise of this story is also for us. That forgiveness is possible, that redemption is possible. And what's amazing here is that this punishment that David is supposed to get, where his son died, God instead takes that same story and offers his own son in our place, making a way for us to receive a grace that we don't deserve, 